on a good day, when I have these little God cookies, like there'll be a time I'm about to do something. Yeah, that's it. Yes. And I, and like the it's like the inventory is just automatic. Like if I do this, I, I I'm gonna have to do inventory on it. This is what it's gonna show me, and then I'm gonna be making amends. Like oh man, thank you God. <laughs> I, heard I heard it through, through the grapevine. Welcome. It's the AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour. Featuring the collective voices of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm Don, an alcoholic in Greensboro, North Carolina. Hey, Don. Hey, everybody. I'm Sam, an alcoholic in Palm Springs, California. Hey, Don, you heard anything good in a meeting lately? Oh, well. I hope the answer is yes. I mean, you've heard all kinds of good things in meetings lately, but anything stand out? <laughs> well, there was a guy at the meeting this morning that was from out of town. He had moved into the Greensboro area. He was talking about walking in there and hearing us talk. It was a room full of strangers, but he knew everybody there. Oh, yeah. And it made me think of that line, AA is a place where strangers go to reminisce. Uh, yeah, I love that line. <laughs> and that is was has so been my experience in the uh, the many years that I've been in AA. I've gotten to travel a lot too and go to AA all over the world. And one of the coolest things I noted was the same characters are in every room. They just got different <laughs> names and faces. I hate that. <laughs> when I came in, I was unique. And to come in and discover, yeah, maybe I'm not as unique as I think I am. <laughs> <laughs> yep you're unique just like everyone else in aa <laughs> it's true i traveled across the country recently and went to some meetings on the west coast the left half mm -hmm. playing over <laughs> here in my neighborhood <laughs> i hadn't been in probably two weeks i went two weeks without a meeting and i was getting crazy that's a long time <laughs> for me you know the the pot was boiling and there was some steam that had to come out. And uh, we were staying at friend's house. And I said, the, as soon as I get there, I want to get to a meeting. And she took me to a, a local meeting. And I within 10 minutes, I was well again. <laughs> it's funny how that happens, isn't it? It's like, well, I get surrounded by my people and it's like, oh, all right. My shoulders can drop. I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. Happens every time. Who's our guest today? Oh, we got this crazy guy going on today. We, we, we've we met him before. Uh, it's Kenneth, and he's going to be uh, in a scintillating game of Stump the Thumpers, our big book <laughs> quiz show. He didn't know about that, though. <laughs> <laughs> now, Kenneth, he's the one that we've talked about before. We've quoted him about brain cells aab how does that yeah, work? something something about kenneth having a brain cell or something like that <laughs> maybe two that can rub together <laughs> just barely <laughs> no we'll have to get you to talk about that too <laughs> well i'm looking forward to being scintillated by our guest <laughs> he does sound like an ideal guest doesn't he okay there's no pressure no pressure you know to explode you just have to be scintillating <laughs> grapevine does not accept donations but you can offer your support by making a purchase at store.aagrapevine.org or by the carry the message gift certificates to sponsor grapevine subscriptions for alcoholics in need that's store.aagrapevine.org So my name is Kenneth. I'm an alcoholic. I am currently in Castlehane, North Carolina, and I've known you guys for several years and uh, got to hang out with you on a previous incarnation of your podcast. The Boil Dow. Yeah, I've been involved with general service and with my local intergroup. My last drink was on June 2nd of the year 2000. So I, I, I decided I wanted to get sober the last year of one century so that my anniversaries would line up with the number of the year in the next century. <laughs> So it's brilliant, <laughs> yeah, isn't it? <laughs> and I, I tell people they can always try to do that, but you're going to have to live a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth, what was going on with you when you got sober that made you decide to give up and come to AA? 
when I got sober this time, as they say, it was uh, 10 years after I had first had that moment of recognition that I was 15 years old in 10th grade, the first time I had any serious consequences from my drinking. Because alcoholism runs in the family so much, I heard people talking about my father's drinking and his father's drinking. And my mom grew up with both of her parents drinking. My mother's father actually got sober in Alcoholics Anonymous in Roanoke, Virginia uh, in the 1950s. So he would have been like one of the old timers there. Um, And unfortunately, he died before I got sober. So I didn't get to have that conversation with him. But I grew up, I had been specifically warned, you know, alcoholism is a disease. It runs in families. It's in our family. You know, look out. So anyway, so I had that. I'd, I'd sworn off alcohol forever for the first time at 15. And my last two years of high school, I didn't drink. I would avoid, I would almost have a panic attack if I got invited to a party. Like I, cause I was like, if there was drinking there, I knew I was going to do it. And I was terrified of what would happen. But then of course I, you know. Well, after, you could feel the pull of it, even though you were. Oh, even like, then I remember being in 11th grade and uh, this girl, this next door neighbor who is older was my ride to school and one day she got to school and she said kenneth i've got a bottle of liquor in the trunk of the car you want to hit it a couple times before we go in and i just remember just like shaking because i knew if i had a couple swigs before school started i was going to get uh suspended for sneaking back into the parking lot during the school day and getting more alcohol i knew even then if i had some before school i was not going to do anything but try to get more alcohol the rest of the day you Uh, knew at such an early age that one drink was going to lead to more yeah well it was because i had i i had tried the drinking before school thing when i was in eighth and ninth grade (laughs) (laughs) i've already had that experience you're an exceptional alcoholic (laughs) but but i had sworn off forever quit for a couple of years, but then started up again. Then when I was 20, I got my first DWI in Charlotte, got to spend weekend in uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg jail, which was an experience. And I was like, All right, I'm done. Well, this is the curious thing about alcoholism, being an alcoholic. I'm physically different than other people. And if I drink it, it sets off a craving. So all I have to do is not drink it. Right. So you decided not to drink it. Right. And so I, at 15, I decided not to drink it. At 20, I decided not to drink it again and did some treatment. But of course, then I had the brilliant, I thought I had invented this, what in AA they sometimes call the marijuana maintenance program. And I always Mm. say, for me, this is not an outside issue because I literally, I had recognized I was an alcoholic and I was like, well, maybe I can try out some other stuff. So I started messing around with pot and pills and stuff, trying to, because I couldn't get through the day without being altered somehow. Mm -hmm. And of course, not only did that, just sort of not work in general, but I mean, I, I, I made it for over a year on that before I started, before the alcohol came back. And consistently, nothing really makes me go buck wild like alcohol. So then my family sent me to rehab, did a nice 28-day program, moved halfway across the state from Greensboro to Wilmington, changed people, places, and things. I was only 25, so I joined the young people's group, and I'd go there every week unless I was busy that week, and ask the guy to be my sponsor. And I even called him not just once, but twice. Only twice. Yeah, well, I guess it must have been May of 2000. I was coming out of that meeting, and this person named Laura pulled me aside and said, "Kenneth, I'm not trying to tell you how to live your life or how to work the program, but I see you're doing everything necessary to relapse, and I feel like I have to say something to you about it." I was like, what? Ooh. What are you talking about? I went to rehab. I've, you know, I've been sober like five months now. You were offended. Yeah. And she's <laughs> like, well, th- I know this is your home group and you, you're hardly ever here. And I'm like, well, I'm here every week. And she's like, we weren't here last week. And I'm like, okay, so I missed one week. And she's like, but they meet uh, twice a week. You only come here on Fridays. And I'm like, well, but you got to understand, I need to find a job. Of course, that meeting was at 9.30 p.m. Like, I'm going to be out, you know. And I was like, I've got a sponsor. He's right over there. And I'm pointing across the parking lot. And she's like, look, I know who your sponsor is. And I know you're not calling him. And I'm like, I've called him. I've called him twice even. You know, and she's just like, she's like, I just want to let you, you're not doing the deal. And, you know, and it's like she was prescient. It was, you know, within two weeks, I was drunk. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, I literally, I relapsed for one week. I was drinking here in Castle Hayne. And I was going to go to Myrtle Beach for the weekend. I, I remember buying a 40 
and chugging it. And, you know, as I was driving down Highway 17 through Brunswick County on my way to South Carolina, I don't remember getting to South Carolina. I don't remember that evening. I don't remember the day on Saturday. Next thing I know, I'm coming out of a blackout and I'm, I'm like strapped down and I start looking around and I hear a little voice in my ear that said, don't move. You're going to mess up the scan. And I'm like, I'm being scanned. Um, I was at a oh, wow. in, mm-hmm. in Grand Strand Hospital in uh, Myrtle Beach. And I was in a car accident. Purely by the grace of God, the people I hit walked away from the accident, but I got mangled pretty good. Apparently, I had swerved in uh, into oncoming traffic at highway speeds, according to the police report, whatever that means. Then they transported me back to Wilmington. Uh, Cape Fear Hospital had an orthopedic center. I needed some bones that had been crushed and smushed, reassembled. Did this speak to you? It did. And I th- I th- I'm always so happy someone in the program loved me enough to let me know I wasn't really doing the deal. Mm-hmm. When I was in the hospital, I knew it was not the case that, oh, I went and tried that AA stuff and it doesn't work. I knew I'd hung around AA and not really done the deal. Mm. And so then when my mom showed up at the hospital, she came in and she didn't even come completely in the room. She was sort of in the doorway and she started talking to me and I could tell it was a rehearsed speech. I was like, oh my God, she's gone to oh. Alabama. Oh no. Oh no. The worst thing that could possibly right. ever happen. And she was just saying, she's like, look, we have bailed you out of jail. We've sent you to rehab. We've sent you to a therapist. We've bought you a new car. You know, cause I, it was one of the first time I'd wrecked a car driving drunk, you know, and she's like, we're done. You, and she said, I don't know where you're going to go when you get out of the hospital, but you're not coming to my house. Mm. And I was just, bro- and I, and the thing is, I could tell how difficult it was for her to say those words, mm. and I, and it just killed. Me. And it's one thing, you know, when you're out there drinking and doing your thing and running amok, you're not thinking about mama, <laughs> you know. I'm not thinking about, yeah. and so it's like she shows up, and it's like, yeah, mom, you're not supposed to see this part of my life. You know, this is not, this yeah. isn't suitable for a mom. This is going to upset you, and you know, it's like, and here I've done it again, you know. As if our behavior doesn't affect other people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. And so when all that came home and say, that was my step one moment. That's when I surrendered to this thing. I didn't at that time believe Alcoholics Anonymous would work for me so much as it's like, I knew I had shown up and not really taken the suggestions and done the deal. So like, I'm going to take every suggestion. If I relapse again, then it'll be your fault. What was different? <laughs> When you came, so when you came back and you started to do the deal Mm -hmm. inside of you, what was different? What could you tell that you were doing that you didn't do before? Uh, I stopped struggling. I stopped fighting against it. I feel I surrendered and I feel like it Mm -hmm. took me 10 years because when I've had that moment of surrender, it was five months after I got out of rehab, five years after my first DWI and treatment and AA meetings and 10 years after I had realized I was an alcoholic and swore off forever for the first time. For me, it was the process of, okay, I'm, I know I have to quit. Okay. Okay. Well, I can't stay quit. So I'm going to, I'm going to quit and I'm do maybe do a little bit of treatment and stuff and try some other things. And then, okay, I'm going to, then it's like, okay, I'm going to quit and I'm going to move across the state and I'll have AA in my back pocket, you know, for emergencies you know, right. like as a, right. as a backup. And then it's like, you know, AA has got to be front and center. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, I'm going to, I just decided I'm going to make that my life. And I haven't had a drink since then. It's been over 22 years now. And my faith in the program has grown from the experience of coming here and seeing the change. Yeah. You know, I'm totally hearing you say that when that surrender hit the way it showed up, and this is my little thing of saying it, I finally decided to do it someone else's way. Exactly. And focus on doing it and not figuring it out or thinking about it. (laughs) And I remember still in early recovery, I used to tell, because I I didn't have a job or a car or a girlfriend or, and I would ask my sponsor like, yeah, but when am I going to get these things? And he'd be like, and I'm glad that I had a sponsor who is honest enough to say, well, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But I know that the people who keep doing this program, keep doing this stuff, the good things come in time and it's in God's time. So he's like, I can't tell you exactly when or how, but eventually it's going to work. 
what was the hardest thing of, okay, you're going to do it someone else's way, which is to say, you're going to do all the steps. You're going to do it with a sponsor. You're going to go to meetings. You're going to pray. You're going to ask God for help and all of that. Well, so I think just that the surrendering to doing it without having to know everything ahead of time and just, just doing it, not knowing specifically the outcome other than the outcome is you get God cookies. You know, I always say it's this program. It's like, <laughs> I you know, love it. It, it. Well, if if you have a recipe for some really yummy cookies, it doesn't matter how you feel that day. It doesn't matter if you believe in it or not. It doesn't matter how this relates to other recipes of cookies that, you know, they may have had in other times and cultures and, you know, religious traditions. If you follow that recipe, you get those cookies. And for me, this is this is the steps are, are a recipe for God cookies. Oh, my oh gosh. My. I love really? it. <laughs> wow, that sounds like it could be a few brain cells working. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and with that elegant segue, would you please tell us what it is you say about brain cells and AA groups? <laughs> well, it's funny. Like, I don't know what I said on the boiled owl that time, but this is now when I was delegate being very involved in general service. And we talk about the group conscience, how the group conscience is based on communication. Formerly, the pamphlet for the GSR said maybe the most important job in Alcoholics Anonymous, because that's what connects the group to the, the structure as a whole. They really want to emphasize the importance because that is what makes that group be connected to AA as a whole, which is how you get to participate in the group conscience. And a lot of things that are in our concepts, you know, the uh, right of decision is really important for developing a group conscience because we have representatives who are instructed instead of informed, they'll show up and instead of forming a group conscience, you know, as a body, wherever they are, they'll just talk over each other, say, this is what I was told to say, and then vote that way and not listen to each other. And so one of the biggest things I know when I went to conference, talking to trustees and past delegates and stuff, listen as if you had no opinion. And what that does is that that allows that two-way communication that creates that generates a group conscience and so the thing i talk about the, the group conscience so that's my conference experience was i felt like i was participating in a well-functioning brain and that thoughts would come up in the body and they would be considered and then changed you know adapted and move forward a group that doesn't have a gsr or someone who's split off is that there are neurons in my head <laughs> that somehow through the interaction of them, uh, it produces the subjective experience of me being Kenneth. And so, and there's sort of like this exterior of things, which you could observe from the outside, which is the brain cells firing and doing whatever. But there's also an interior experience that just these atoms and molecules as they're interacting, there's this consciousness, but the consciousness is only there when they're interacting. You could have, you could take my brain and keep all the cells alive in separate little dishes, you know, in a nutrient bath or whatever, and they would all be alive and they would all be functioning and they would fire when they're supposed to fire and they would do whatever they do, but there would be no consciousness known as Kenneth. Like that, the process that would produce my consciousness would not exist because it only exists when the when those neurons are interacting. And how exactly that works, we don't know, but I know by a direct personal experience that there is an interior subjective experience of being the person whose neurons are firing like that. And so similarly, you could have an AA group that is not connected to the rest of the fellowship and it'll still be alive and people can go there and, and meet other people and they can, they'll do whatever they're doing. But in terms of the, the consciousness that is AA as a whole, they're just not a part of it. Okay, so this is a, like a really trippy way of saying if your group doesn't have a GSR representative, you need to get one if you want to participate in the brain. Right. Yeah, if you want to be part of or part of this fellowship, part of the the group conscience of AA as a whole. Absolutely. <laughs> but even that same thing And that needs to be an active GSR, not one in name only. <laughs> right. One one that's weird the way there's communication going back and Yeah, forth. the communication is the thing. Right. I, mean, I, I believe that literally that's what creates the group conscience is that interaction. I just love that. Me too. So you've been sober 20 years. Mm -hmm. 
Did you do a lot of acid? <laughs> <laughs> Not in sobriety. <laughs> no, I know. I know. Did you used to do a lot of acid? I know. Oh my God. Certainly some. <laughs> Done with hitting with the hard questions. We're digging deep these days, guys. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I did. I went to Guilford College. Okay. <laughs> We, we need to, to wrap this up. <laughs> Kenneth, stick around because, you know, we've got that surprise quiz show that we're about to throw you into oh, the boy. deep end of. So. <laughs> and that means it's time to play Stump the Thumpers. That's a big book. And here is our quiz master, Donnie Wani Ding Dong. <laughs> Thanks, Spammy. <laughs> I've researched the first 164 pages of the big book. And Dr. And, Bob's story. But no other stories, just Dr. Bob. Let's keep this simple, Sam. Mm -hmm. I've found a few easy questions for our contestants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> easy. It's only easy if you know the answer. That's right. It's multiple choice. It's as easy as picking blackberries. Mm -hmm. There's lots of thorns in those blackberry bushes, you know. <laughs> what is he going to win, Sam? The warm glow of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's how it becomes scintillating. <laughs> <laughs> is that all? <laughs> well, um, how about a parade? Okay, I like I mean, it. everyone loves a parade. <laughs> yeah. We'll each parade around in our little Brady Bunch boxes here on screen. <laughs> <laughs> I've got three questions today. Guess right and gain 2,000 points. That's Ooh. a lot of points. <laughs> but Kenneth is an alcoholic. I don't think I've ever had that many points before. <laughs> he needs a lot of encouragement. We all need yeah. a lot of encouragement. Wait, is that 2,000 points for each one? Each yes. one. Each one. Oh, my God. Each one. Unless you guess wrong and you lose 2,000 points. Uh, yeah, but you know, <laughs> we'll take care of you because I'm the one who's keeping track of the points, Kenneth. Okay. <laughs> I got you covered. All right. Well, Kenneth, are you ready? I guess. <laughs> Here we go. In how it works, we're told that selfishness is the root of our troubles. It says we are driven by a hundred forms of fear, blank, self-seeking, and self-pity. Fill in the blank. I'm going to list four possibilities, but only one is correct. Which one? I'm going to give it to you again. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, blank, self-seeking, and self-pity is the blank. Nervousness. Two, paranoia. Three, self-delusion. Four, dementia. I can hear those again. Yes. <laughs> Nervous. I, I thought I knew the answer, but it's not any of the words she said. <laughs> <laughs> Nervousness, paranoia, self-delusion, dementia. Uh, self-delusion. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's it. The answer is on page 62. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. We step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. The answer is number three, self-delusion. And you now have 2,000 points. All right, that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hearing it again, I thought the answer was self-seeking, but that you had already said that word. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was pretty much the perfect human specimen when I came into AA. Self-delusion was not a problem for me. Uh, what, so what do you mean by perfect? You, you're going to have to define perfect there, Don. <laughs> Did you have problems when you came in with the self-perception? I mean, you, I guess you talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything that was going on with me. I didn't realize that what my ego does basically is convince me that I'm separate from you. Mm. Keeps me cut off. And you could tell me that, and I'd be like, oh, yes, that's very wise. Because I was all into, you know, being <laughs> wise and astute. So I would like to say wise things, but I, I, yeah, it just wasn't all there. Yeah. Okay. In how it works, it says we throw ourselves harder into helping others. We think of their needs and work for them. This takes us out of ourselves. 
it quiets the imperious urge. What is the imperious urge? One, greed. Two, sex. Three, gluttony. Four, an urgent need to pee. <laughs> I, I think any of those could be, but sex is normally the one that's associated with <laughs> the imperious urge. <laughs> that's it. Ding, ding, ding. The answer on page 70. If sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves the harder into helping others. This takes us out of ourselves. It quiets the imperious urge when to yield would mean heartache. The imperious urge is indeed number two, sex, and you now have 4,000 points. Good Lord. Dude, you were racking them up, and I'm not even having to cheat for you. <laughs> Kenneth, tell us about your sex trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Digging deep this time, Don. Yeah, I was, I was afraid that I, I didn't have enough of it, or it wasn't the right kind. Yeah. <laughs> was, it a, was, was it no flavor for your fare, or a straight pepper diet? <laughs> yeah. well, I, I referenced... <laughs> <laughs> when I was 15, I first recognized that I was uh, alcoholic. What had happened was I ended up essentially losing my virginity on somebody's front porch in downtown Wilmington, the historic district, to a, a person who's like twice my age. That again, in hindsight, I'm like, that wasn't really on me. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I was a drunken 15 year old. And the whole thing was just kind of humiliating and scary. It was the 80s. I was sure I had AIDS. I mean, it was just crazy. I was so eat up with shame and guilt and everything else. And I tell you, one of the amazing things about Alcoholics Anonymous, they, people say you can't change your past. When I was about a year sober, I got a chance to tell my story for the first time. I started telling that story and people started laughing and I started kind of hamming it up and getting more and more and talk, talking about the, you know, skipping school and the the cab driver that I got was like, where are you going? I'm like, to the health department and he's like oh are they doing flu shots i'm like oh i don't, I don't know anything about flu shots and he's like <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, i started telling that story and people started laughing about it and suddenly like my, this deep dark secret i had this is like what it says on page 124 about our dark past becoming our greatest possession this is yes. this is a, a laugh line i have now um, I told my story at the Castle Hain group here not too long ago, which is a group of mostly women. A couple of them had heard my story before, and they're like, we want the porch story. Because <laughs> 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 they're so, like, it's so funny. Sharing with others leeches the shame out of it. It absolutely does. And it helps other people. Yeah, and, they, and, and far from shunning me, people like me for it. People are like, that was a great story. I can't believe you told that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the last question here. <laughs> On page 66, it says something or other is the dubious luxury of normal men. But for alcoholics, these things are poison. What is the particular dubious luxury of normal men referred to here? One. Just a f oh. <laughs> <laughs> Drinking with impunity. Two. Vanity. Three. Anger, four diamonds and pearls. Anger, justifiable anger. That is correct. On page 66, it says, if we were to live, we had to be free of anger. The grouch and the brainstorm were not for us. They may be the dubious luxury of normal men, but for alcoholics, these things are poison. So Don, actually the answer is the grouch and the brainstorm, not like, uh, not anger. You're wrong. <laughs> Don, that's minus 20,000 points. <laughs> Ken, you get an extra 20,000. So you're at 24,000 now. Yeah. Wait a minute. Maybe <laughs> be the dubious luxury. You're right. <laughs> wrong. <laughs> well, I said just a, it's the justifiable anger is really the thing that takes us out. It is. That's what my question well, was. But you're right, though, Sam. It's the dubious. In the Wait, say that again, Don. You're <laughs> right, Sam. It says awesome. that. <laughs> Would you say it one more time? Yeah. <laughs> no, he's not going to say write it Write this again. down on your calendar. <laughs> Today, Sam was right. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth, thanks for joining us today. Oh, this has this been a gonna, blast. It has. <laughs> Ken, you are so much fun to talk with. Thank you. Oh, 
you guys are playing. leaving here the other night. Yeah, this guy pulled a gun on me and said, your money or your life. <laughs> what did you do? Well, I told him I was just a drunk and that I didn't have any money or much of a life. He let me go. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not that funny. Thanks for joining us. The AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour is posted every Monday and is produced by AA Grapevine, Inc. We don't speak for AA as a whole. We share the experience, strength, and hope of members to help others recover from alcoholism. Podcast info, including how to call in, is at aagrapevine.org slash podcast. Find AA Grapevine on Instagram and the AA Grapevine channel on YouTube. All things Grapevine are available at aagrapevine.org. If you want to know more about AA, Google Alcoholics Anonymous and your city or visit aa.org.